Okay, I'm going to read to you something from, um, what's his last, his last name is Greg, I can't remember his first name, but this was something that struck him when he was, um, well, you'll get the picture here. So it's called uh, Beachwear, Beachwear versus Malibu Barbie, okay? But I thought it was a very interesting story. The day glow pink lycra was gaining on me effortlessly. In other words, he's running along the beach, okay? Under Armour running shoes, Bluetooth headphones, and one of those arm belt thingies to carry a perfectly accessorized, ergonomically optimized water bottle. It occurred to me that perhaps I was not Sylvester Stallone in Rocky IV working out to Eye of the Tiger, but rather a middle-aged man sweating profusely and running in what can only be really described as beachwear. Yesterday's t-shirt, swimming shorts with a seahorse pattern, and my old faithful green Converse boots. <laughs> in other words, Barbie's getting ready to run past him, and Barbie's perfectly, you know, and not sweating, and he's <laughs> sweating profusely. Malibu Barbie was about to glide past a distinctly unaccessorized, disastrously under-exercised Ken. Feigning a sudden overwhelming need to admire the view, I paused to look away as she passed by. A couple of minutes later, I saw another runner approaching, this time coming towards me. It was a man even older and rounder than me. Face as red as a lobster, no lycra, no headphones, in fact, no dignity at all. Every pace clearly an almighty act of the will. You're doing great, I wheezed. Thanks, she gasped, and we passed. I wanted to hug him, to cheer him on, to wrap one of those silver blankets around his shoulders and hand him cups of water like he was running a marathon, which in a way, perhaps he was. Here's the part. This is when it hit him. It's easy to forget how many people I meet today will be running an uphill race, quietly fighting a very hard battle. Indeed, trying their best to do the right thing, to be good and to do good. They won't necessarily be looking as good as the, pink, the girl in pink lycra, outpacing and outgracing every turn. But one of the wonderful things about grace is that it makes righteousness relative. Righteousness becomes literally relative, a relationship between me and my brokenness and God and his kindness. The word I would use there is chesed. Mm -hmm. This makes the world look different. The guy vaping and cursing on the street may have taken more radical steps toward Jesus th this week than the local pastor. We judge with what we see on our eyes. We have no idea what they're going through. They may have just conquered a major spiritual battle, but they're doing something we see and think is, oh, I wouldn't do that. No, but you wouldn't have walked through what they walked through either, you know. <clears throat> this makes the world look different. The lady who seems distracted while I'm talking to her might in fact be doing well just to have made it out of the house. <laughs> Man, I resembled that remark many times. The mother who yelled at her daughter this morning might be doing a far better job of parenting than she ever received herself. It's never been the saint with perfect prayers that attracted his attention, but the sinner sobbing in the shadows, snotty and struggling to find a single word to say other than, oh, I'm sorry. Or to put it in another way, Jesus is not here to cheer Malibu Barbie. She's doing fine. But the lobster red runner struggling on as best as he can along the same path. Is that good? I thought that was really good. I especially liked the guy vaping and cursing on the street. May have taken more radical steps toward Jesus this week than the local self-righteous right? Mm -hmm. mm. Anyway, I thought it was worth reading. Like I always say, don't, don't engage up here mm -hmm. with what you see with your eyes and what you think you hear with your ears. This isn't reality. Mm -hmm. You have no idea. People had no idea. Sometimes my just walking out the door was a miracle. 
a miracle, bona fide miracle. Miracles are things that happen out of the ordinary. Okay. It, so Abba today. Help us not to engage and react on the surface with what we see with our eyes and what we hear with our ears. Help us to be your hands and your feet extended. Help us to know, Abba, pour out wisdom. Give us wisdom to discern truth. And not to be afraid to call it out, but to be bold to speak the truth. Even if it goes against what is seen, even if it goes against the norm, even if anybody else laughs at us like they did in Noah, Help us to be faithful to you. In the precious name of your son, we ask. Amen. Okay. So, um, y'all know I don't dream. Mm -hmm. And if I dream and remember a dream, it's significant. Mm -hmm. I actually wrote it down or attempted to write it down. I'm sure I missed stuff. Um, but I'm going to read it to you because today's the day to do that. While waiting to leave, it was very odd. I was driving through the mountains. I go to a man's house on my way to the promised land. Promised land came after the dream. It wasn't in the dream, but I knew I was going and I knew where I was going, okay? And it's a great distance from here. <laughs> I had an early morning departure but it was dark. I knew the day and the time to be ready. I knew the day and the time to be ready. I was not at my home and I needed to get to a man to take me to the airport. And yet here I am in a car. How odd. And I'm in the mountains. But when I arrived at his house, everything was off. Odd. It was on the ravine side of the road on a hill that his house was at. It was early morning, dark, but his wife and his children were up and a meal was being cooked and I could smell the roasted meat. It was very significant that it stood out roasted meat. We were to have a meal before I left. The house was chaotic and yet I was peaceful and aware of the chaos. And yet, even seeing this in the house and being aware of what was going in the house, thinking I was in the house, I was in my car. I parked on the side of the road I looked at my flight and departure time and discovered that I had not calculated the travel time to the airport correctly. I was wrong. I needed to be at the airport at the time designated that we were going to be leaving. I'm trying to decide if I go in and explain that I don't have time to talk and eat or if I go. I don't have my camera. You all know my camera is important to me. I don't have my tennis shoes on. I'm, in sand I'm, on I'm wearing sandals. I don't have a packed bag. I don't have an itinerary. I don't have my passport, but I need to be at the airport or at what I think is the airport. I need to be at my destination. There's a certain place I need to be and I don't have time to waste. I don't have anything that I think I want or I need, ready or not, but I still move forward, compelled to get to my destination, to catch my ride, to be there. Do I turn back? Do I go home? and get what I think I need, or what I think I want, or do I continue to make it to my destination? The end. I didn't look back, I went. I didn't go in, I went. Don't be distracted. Don't turn back. Don't grab things you think you need. He tells you to go, go. Be ready and go. He'll supply everything else. There, there was a lot. I don't know. The day I had the dream, I, mm -hmm. I think I shared with you something probably more than that. But, And I shared it with you because it was odd. <laughs> I was like, I had a dream and I remembered it. But I smelled roasted yeah. meat. Almost like a sacrifice, a <clears throat> feast, a festival that you and we were supposed to celebrate before I left. No, I don't have time for that. I don't know. I don't know. So the trains, they're interesting. 
Mm -hmm. They are, aren't they? They. I haven't. Seen, I can't. I can't even tell you they're trained right now. But I sure that they're okay with me. And so, told me what she thought. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Which is also unusual because I'm not an interpreter. Yeah. I. I don't really drink. Now I don't even recall. I remember right then when it, when I shared it, and then. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. It was. Um, but he gave an interpretation. Which was also yes. okay. Do you remember what if it was? It's from God. No, because it wasn't mine. It was yours. Yeah. So I, yeah. You know. Something about water and flying things. Oh, oh! I do remember. I do remember. <laughs> I do remember. I do remember. I do remember. She was walking with someone, a woman, in a stroller, mm -hmm. and they were walking, and all of a sudden, water started coming. You know, water can represent chaos, mm -hmm. but when she was telling me, I was thinking Shemayim heavens mm. and she was at peace and then at some point it was all around her. it was all in yeah. front of her but she never looked, looked back, back and didn't turn to go back okay mm -hmm. so um you just keep you just keep going on your destination it was the same thing don't turn don't back mm -hmm. don't turn back don't go back mm -hmm. but no what about that family what about your family? Mm -hmm. There's a scripture. Okay, I guess we're going to skip to that. I guess we are. Okay. I'm in Luke chapter 9, 57. You don't need to go there if you don't want to. As they were traveling on the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. When Yeshua answered him, the foxes have holes and the birds flying about have nests, but the Son of Man has no home of his own. To another when he said, follow me. But the man said, sir, first let me go and bury my father. Mm -hmm. You know, to bury your father in in a Jewish, it's not a day, it's not a week, it's years because you wait. There's a process where the bones are put in the thing and then you <coughs> wrap them down and then you keep wrapping them down and you put them further and further in the tomb. It's, 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 a, it's not a, a week, a month, a, a, a year. It's a while. And apparently this one, he's, he's not even dead or he wouldn't have been here. He would have been in the process. So he hadn't even died yet. First, let me bury my father. After I'm done with that, then I'll. Um, and Yeshua said, let the dead bury their own dead. You go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another one said, I will follow you, sir. But first, let me go say goodbye to the people at home. Kind of goes with my dream. To him, Yeshua said, no one who puts his hand to the plow and keeps looking back is fit to serve in the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. That's tough for mamas. Yeah, it is. It's tough for mamas. It's tough for grandmas. It's tough for mamas and grandmas. It's not so tough for the man. It really isn't. He's very logical. He gets it. They'll either follow or they won't. Whereas women are like, come on and drag, right? Yeah. <laughs> We're going to drag you. <clears throat> um, so don't look back. Don't look back. And I think that's probably the whole message for the day. Don't look back. Okay. So where we left off um, two weeks ago now, right? Was that where we were talking about who his father and his, I mean, who his mother and his brothers were, remember mm -hmm. the family. And and we went through a whole long list because at first it says, you know, they've come, they think, we got to go take charge of him. He's lost his mind, mm -hmm. right? Okay, they didn't call him a moron. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, he's kind of he's kind of lost his mind. We need to go take care of that. So they were going to go take charge. Um. And while he was still speaking to the crowd, his mother and his brothers appeared outside. But he said, look, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does what my father in heaven wants, that person is my brother and my sister and my mother. And then the very next chapter for in Matthew chapter 13, it says that same day. So it's a long day. When he teaches, he teaches. Okay? I mean, he's at it for hours. And there are so many people that there's no room right in the houses to sit and to eat and to... Do the normal things, right? Okay. 
Matthew chapter 13, verse 1. That same day, Yeshua went out of the house and sat down by the lake. But such a large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat and he sat there while the crowd stood on the shore. He told them many things in parables. We were there. You could basically, if you were up against the right heel side, you've got your amphitheater. <laughs> so, you know, he had a ready-made amphitheater. And he speaks to them in parables. A farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path. And the birds came and ate it up. Hmm. You know, on a path, right? So if you drop seeds on the walkway, mm -hmm. they didn't, they're not going to penetrate. They're not going to go into the ground. So the birds are going to come and eat them up. Other seed fell on the rocky patches where there was not much soil. So it sprouted up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun had risen, the young plants were scorched, and since their roots were not deep, they dried up. If you read Mark and Luke, one of them tells you that, and it didn't have water. It gives you a little extra detail, which I think is interesting, water. But this one said it dried up. Verse 7, other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. But others fell into rich soil and produced grain a hundred or sixty or thirty times as much has been sown. Those who have ears, let them hear. Then the Talmudim, the disciples came and they asked Yeshua, why are you speaking to them in parables? Oh, isn't that funny? Didn't you want to know? Inquiring minds want to know. He answered, because it has been given to you to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but it has not been given to them. Okay, newsflash. The secrets were revealed in scripture and called the New Testament. We call it the New Covenant. So if anybody tells you, oh, we found a book, whatever book they want to call it. We found another. We have, we know the secrets. Funny, so do I. They're right here. If they tell you that it's anywhere other than here, if they preach to you any other gospel, <coughs> no. Not only no, but you know my phrase. Hell no, because that's where it'll lead you, okay? Mm -hmm. It'll lead you astray. It's not correct. <clears throat> because it has been given to you to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but it has not been given to them. For anyone who has something will be given more, so that he will have plenty. Remember when we tapped down the, pow the uh, powdered sugar, the brown sugar, mm -hmm. right? How much we got into it? Mm -hmm. We got a lot, didn't we? Okay. So when I had a full jar, he said, no. Nope. And I got almost twice, right? He'll give you more. All right. It's a biblical principle. But from anyone who has nothing, even what he does have will be taken away. Here is why I speak to them in parables. They look without seeing and they listen without hearing or understanding. That is, in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Yeshuahu, Isaiah. Oh, let's look at it. Let's look at that prophecy. Well, if I could. It's right there. I know. But it's also mm -hmm. right there out of Isaiah. You will keep on hearing but never understand and keep on seeing but never perceive because the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears, they barely hear. With their eyes they have closed, so as not to see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and do teshuva. What is teshuva? Turn. Turn. So that I could heal them. In Isaiah, the quote is, he said, go and tell this people, yes, you hear, but you do, don't understand. You certainly see, but you don't get the point. Make the heart of this people sluggish with fat. Stop up their ears and shut their eyes. Otherwise, seeing with their eyes and hearing with their ears, then understanding with their hearts, they will repent to Shuvah, turn, and be healed. Which is why I pray. Abba, for all, I name my children, I name people, families, I name family members, I name friends, by name. Give them eyes to see. Give them ears to hear. Give them hearts to comprehend so that they will turn to Shuva. Hunt them down relentlessly and pull them out of the pit and the wherever that they have walked and deemed to be correct and cause them 
to hunger and thirst after your righteousness, right? Mm -hmm. That's why I pray that, okay? <clears throat> so look out, young man, because I pray for you by name. And Psalm 23, if you read it and you look up the, the words in the Hebrew, you know where you are, he will hunt you down relentlessly and pull you out of the pit that you are in. Now let's get back to Matthew, since we went to Isaiah too, right? But you, how blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. Do you have eyes to see and ears to hear? Not here. Not here, right? Don't engage here. Spiritual eyes to see, spiritual ears to hear. <clears throat> I tell you that many a prophet and many a zadik. What is a zadik? A righteous man, a righteous person, a zadik, righteous. Can we be righteous? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Am I saved by my own righteousness? Mm -hmm. No, but we can live righteous lives. Mm -hmm. Okay. He wouldn't have told us to do it if we couldn't, right? Okay. All right. And so I tell you that many a prophet and many a Zadik long to see the things you are seeing but did not see them, and to hear the things you are hearing but did not hear them. He longed to see Messiah. Kind of like right now, we long for him to come. The king is coming. <coughs> Only this time he's coming as conquering king. It's not going to be the the suffering servant. It's not going to be the lamb. It's not going to be gentle. It's going to be ferocious. It's going to be war. It's going to be loud. It's going to be loud. So listen to what the parable of the sower means. Whoever hears the message about the kingdom but doesn't understand it. Wow. Okay, is, that as plain? is that plain enough? Mm -hmm. Is like the seed sown along the path. The evil one comes and seizes what was sown in his heart. Just immediately. You, you just, you didn't get, oh, that was a cute story, and on they go. Okay? The seed sown on rocky ground is like a person who hears the message and accepts it with joy at once, but has no root. Have you ever, I've seen, I've literally seen this happen. I've literally spoken to people who heard the message and received it with joy, but they had no root. So they stay on for a little while, but as soon as trouble came or persecution or something, oh, the world or something enticing, something distracting, they immediately fell away. Oh, wait, you don't do, oh, no, we're going to do this. Oh, okay. Breaks your heart. It's heartbreaking. The moral of that story is, be like Paul and let them follow you around before you rebuke the spirit and put word in them so that there's some root. Okay, sorry. That was not part of his parable. I'm just, you know, whatever. <clears throat> now the seed sown among the thorns stands for someone who hears the message, but is choked out by the worries of the world and the deceitful glamour of wealth so that it produces nothing. Didn't you say yesterday you popped up with that verse? Um, but money is the root of all evil. The glamour of wealth, the riches of fame. How many people have we seen started in a church choir? Their voices were beautiful, but then they got full of themselves, and now they worship the devil. Quite a few. I mean, I could name names. You could name names. Anybody on the top, you know, pop, world's music? A lot of them had church roots, church upbringing, excuse me, rocky ground. They were on rocky ground. However, now see that, so it says, so that it produces nothing, at least nothing of eternal value. It might produce, you know, the, the singers that I'm talking about, they're producing other fruit, but not godly fruit. Mm -hmm. However, what was sown on rich soil is the one who hears the message and understands it. Pray for understanding. Pray for discernment. If you don't understand something that you read, keep reading. Put it on some things that you're going to put on the shelf, and eventually you'll go, oh, wait, that, oh, and you can put the pieces together, mm -hmm. okay? Just because you don't understand it right away doesn't mean you're not on good soil, okay? 
there's a lot of scripture. There's a lot of things that's taken me years and years to understand. Okay? Somebody speaks a foreign language to you. You're not going to grasp it right away. you got to learn. Okay? So that's what that means. All right. However, what was sown on rich soil is the one who hears the message and understands it. Such a person will surely bear fruit a hundred or sixty or thirty times what was sown. Yeshua put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while people were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. But when the wheat sprouted and formed heads of grain, the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seeds in your field? Where have these weeds come from? And he answered, An enemy has done this. And the servants asked him, Then do you want us to go and pull them up? But he said, No, because if you pull up the weeds, you might uproot some of the wheat at the same time. Let them both grow up together. Have you ever had a problem with that? Man, but why? <coughs> we don't get it. We don't see things the same way. Because if you take out a root that's right next to a good, you're going to take out a good one too. Wow. Hmm. Let them both grow together until the harvest. And at the harvest time, I will tell the reapers to collect the weeds first and tie them in bundles to be burned. But to gather the weed into my barn. Oh. So the moral of this story is to trust you. Not to focus on the weed but on you. And yeah, there's a weed growing right next to me, and yeah, it's a weed, and it's not, see, this is in the church. This isn't, this is, this is who we, who, professors. Remember I say there's possessors and professors. I'm not talking about the evil of the world. This is not the evil of the world, okay? This is the seed in the field and planted next to it. There are those that come in that are not right. God says, I'll take care of it. Trust me. I'll take care of it. Trust me. See, at the beginning of the parable, which I think most people often overlook, is it says the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven. I, God, the kingdom of heaven, I've planted seed. Don't disturb my seed. No, if you pull that one out, this one's going to go down with him. Trust me, get your eyes off of the seed, get your eyes off of the field, get your eyes off of the weeds and keep your focus on, keep the main thing, the main thing. Man, maybe if they'd have taught us that along with the parable, we wouldn't have gotten so hung up on why doesn't he take out the weed? Well, he told you because in taking out the weed, it might harm one of his, but the weeds are harming his. Only if you're focusing on the weed. Mm -hmm. Only if you're communing with the weed. Recognize it as a weed and leave it alone. Mm -hmm. Wow. That would have saved a lot of heartache. <laughs> He's going to collect them and tie them into bundles and the weeds are going to go be burned. But the weed is going to go into his barn, right? Yeshua put before them another parable. Did you catch this one? The kingdom of heaven. Oh, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man takes and sows in his field. It's the smallest of all seeds. Have you ever seen a mustard seed? Of course, it's not like the mustard we had for Passover. <laughs> that was crushed, okay? Tiny, 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 tiny. It's the tiniest of seeds. It's the smallest of all seeds, but when it grows up, it's larger than any garden plant and becomes like a tree so that the birds flying about can come and nest in its branches. See, take the seed. Mm -hmm. Be the good soil. Let the sun shine on you, the real sun. Let the Holy Spirit, the real water, water you. Be good soil. The seed's pure. The sun's pure, perfect sunlight. The Holy Spirit's pure, good water. The only thing you're in charge of is the soil. That's you. Be good soil. Be good soil. And he told them yet another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast. Ah, this one I can relate to, right? Mm -hmm. That a woman took and mixed with a bushel of flour, and then she waited until what? 
the whole batch is rising, right? You take a little bit of yeast, you add, take it and put it in all my big batch. I can mix flour and water together and salt. If I wait over enough time, sourdough mm -hmm. occurs. But if I add yeast to it, <laughs> mm -hmm. that baby's going to rise. Mm -hmm. This is, I think, the first time where I see that yeast is a, not a negative thing in Scripture. <laughs> okay, because this time he's saying the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that's added to flour and water and salt. And what happens? It rises. it rises. Salt is a covenant. Remember, salt's a covenant. Mm -hmm. Okay? All of our offerings are to be mixed with salt. Salt is, is the covenant of God. That's all you need to remember. Salt represents God's covenant. That's, that's the secret. Salt represents the God's, God's covenant. Salt is a preserver. God, is a cov God keeps covenant. It's only dependent on him. The whole covenant is dependent on him. Everything is dependent on him. Nothing I do. Okay? But all of our offerings are to be mingled with salt, to remember his covenant. Okay. Oh, until the whole batch of dough rose. All these things Yeshua said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without using a parable. This was to fill what had been spoken through the prophet. Oh, David in Psalms, I will open my mouth in parables. I will say what has been hidden since the creation of the universe. And then he left his crowd. We'll stop there. He came and fulfilled scripture, right? Mm -hmm. Is it all fulfilled? No. no, no. So nothing has been passed away because until every thing in scripture was fulfilled and not everything has been fulfilled, quite a bit of it. All right. The kingdom of heaven. Be good soil. Be good soil. May Adonai Hashem, the eternal existing one, adore you, guard you, watch over you, protect you, save you, celebrate you, and treasure you. May he cause the light of his presence to shine upon you and within you. May his presence be illuminated upon you and within you. May he forgive your offenses and impart unmerited adoration, favor, mercy, and consideration upon you. May Adonai's presence within you, upon you, and toward you be set, directed, and extended to you. Continuously carry you, support you, sustain you, pardon you. Give and ordain, establish, determine, and fix complete soundness of mind, safety, quiet tranquility, contentment, and friendship to you. Adonai. Vishmarakam Yaiher Adonai Panavalecha Vihunecha Yesai Adonai Panavalecha Yeshlam Ha Shalom Shabbat Shalom Go straight no turning back, no looking back, no going back. Be good soil, because he's the perfect seed, pure seed, pure water from the Holy Spirit, pure sunshine from our sun, right? Okay, be fruitful and multiply. <laughs>